I'm Todd Lights, Public Information Officer for MySafeLA. It's my job to teach children, families, and older adults how to be safe in their homes, and how to prepare for disasters like wildfires and earthquakes. Every day, MySafeLA's safety instructors visit schools, community centers, businesses, and homeowners associations all over Los Angeles to share safety messages. But we know we can only reach so many people one-on-one, -on -one, and that's why we've created this older adult safety film so we can broaden our reach and bring our safety messages directly to you. Meet Karen, Marvin, and Marilyn. These three older adults are living independently in the heart of Los Angeles. Before I retired, I was a physical therapist for many years. I worked in long-term care geriatrics for a long time, which I love. Uh, I always say that anybody that's lived 80 years has a story to tell. Since retiring, Karen's been busier than ever, playing the piano and flute, singing in a local choir, and leading her neighborhood Tai Chi class. Marilyn and Marvin just celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. Can you believe we've been married 50 years? Nope. Wow. And, the, and the, uh, 1972 and 1989 were good years. What can I tell you? That's a joke. All right. That's a joke. After years in single-family suburban homes, Marilyn and Marvin wanted to be near their grandson, so they moved to Los Angeles. They chose a two-bedroom, high-rise apartment, 11 stories up. Marilyn, Marvin, and Karen plan on staying independent for years to come. But these three know that with independence comes responsibility. That means staying safe and doing what they can to prevent disasters like house fires. Older adults are at the greatest risk of injury and even death in a house fire. In fact, if you're 55 years or older, you're twice as likely to die in a house fire. But there are plenty of ways to lower that risk. First, and most important, a working smoke alarm. Studies show that people with working smoke alarms in their homes are 50% more likely to survive a house fire than those who don't have a working smoke alarm. In Los Angeles, the statistics are even more eye-opening. On average, 20 people die in house fires in the city each year. And studies show that 19 of those fatalities can be linked to no working smoke alarms in the homes that burn. People who are dying in fires either do not have a smoke alarm or had dead or missing batteries. So bottom line, if you have a working smoke alarm, your chances of surviving are doubled. Karen, Marvin, and Marilyn all have working smoke alarms in their homes. But do they have enough? I'm really glad we have the three smoke alarms in the house. Oh, I think it's so important. The more the better, honestly. One in each bedroom, one in the upstairs hall. One in each of the bedrooms, right, right. there's one in the hall. Where are you going to hear these alarms? So every level of the home, and first and foremost, those sleeping areas. Karen feels confident with three smoke alarms on her second floor, but she wants an alarm on her first floor too. So with a little help, she's installing one. And it's multi-hazard detector for you. Karen's alarm of choice combos as a carbon monoxide detector as well, just like Marilyn and Marvin's alarm in their hallway. You know, not only is it the law, but I really like the fact that this smoke alarm also is a CO alarm, because you can't smell that stuff, but the alarm will really let me know what's happening. You cannot have your own senses detect carbon monoxide. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it. And then the symptoms mimic a flu so exact that a lot of people, if they're having a carbon monoxide exposure at a low level, might want to go to bed, which is the opposite thing that you should be doing. 
Having an audible alarm is the only way of knowing that you have carbon monoxide in the home. Which is why California state law requires CO alarms in all homes. Well, this is a combination smoke fire and carbon monoxide alarm. Karen has chosen a place in her living room for her new combination smoke and CO alarm. If not on the ceiling, alarms should be placed high on the wall, 4 to 12 inches from the ceiling. These details are always included in your alarm's packaging, along with, well, everything else. Honestly, today, it comes with everything that you need, the screws, the bracket, the smoke alarm, and the batteries. So many people ask if batteries come with smoke alarms, and they do. It's actually part of the UL standard. It's a requirement. Let's just test it. You're going to hear two different sounds. Smoke and fire. Carbon monoxide. Whether your smoke alarms have AA batteries like Karen's new one, or a 9-volt battery like Marvin's, it's a good idea to test them once a month. Changing batteries every six months, when you change the clocks forward and back, assures your smoke alarms are always protecting you. And unlike Marilyn, Marvin, and Karen, smoke alarms don't get better with age. If they're 10 years or older, it's time to replace them. Typically, if you want to know how old an alarm is, you can pull it off the wall and you can look on the back and see. But a great rule of thumb to know is if you're in doubt, throw out, replace it. You can find a smoke alarm today for 10 to $15. It's easy to do, very affordable, great peace of mind. It stands to reason that this room would be the most likely place for a fire to start. The combination of heat sources and cooking surfaces make the kitchen one of the most dangerous places in any home, even here in a fire station. In fact, statistics show that the majority of house fires start in the kitchen. I love to cook, and also I love to eat, so that's important. I rarely go out to eat. I cook 21 meals a week. My kitchen is small. I have to be careful and plan ahead. Part of that planning ahead involves the right tools, at the ready in case Karen needs them. like a fire extinguisher. Fire extinguishers should be stored in or near the kitchen, but never over your cooking surface. And the best firefighting tool in your house is only good if the needle is in the green. It has a little gauge, and you have to uh, make sure periodically that the little indicator is on the green. That means that a uh, fire extinguisher is charged and ready to use. Fire extinguishers, like batteries, lose charge, even if they're not used. Check your extinguisher once a month when you check your smoke alarm batteries. And if it loses its charge, you don't have to throw it away. Simply Google Refill Fire Extinguisher to find a place near you to recharge yours. I learned about uh, all sorts of fires because my father was a fire protection engineer and this was common talk so I know that if there's grease fires you never throw water on them. As an experienced cook, Karen has dealt with her share of flare-ups in the kitchen. Fortunately, from an early age she knew that grease fires and water do not mix. Here's what happens to food being pan-fried in oil that catches fire. When we add water, this small fire doesn't stay small. When water is introduced, it sends hot grease flying, as well as the food that's on fire. And what started out as an inconvenient pan fire can quickly turn into a true emergency. In case of a grease fire, uh, I keep baking soda very close, and I also have pot lids very close. 
A pot lid, or even a cookie sheet if it's big enough, when slid carefully over the pan, will put out a grease fire pretty quickly. That's because it smothers the fire, denying it oxygen. Oxygen is one of the three elements fire needs to burn. Cut off that oxygen supply, and you put out the fire. Baking soda does the same thing. It's not just an essential ingredient in cooking, it's also a terrific kitchen safety tool. Just a little bit can smother a small fire completely within just a few seconds. Pot handles can be a big problem in the little bitty kitchen like that. I make sure that they are not sticking out for people to run into. When a pot handle extends beyond the stove, it's easy to brush past it and send hot water or food flying. Remember to turn your pot handles in, away from the stove edge, or slide pots onto back burners where they're well clear of kitchen traffic. Well, there are certain times when I do avoid cooking, when I'm very tired. I think it's a lot better to pour a bowl of cereal. And I don't happen to take any medication that affects me right now, but if I did, I would watch the cooking very carefully. If you're concerned about any medications you take, ask your doctor or pharmacist about possible side effects and interactions. I've noticed recently in the past year, and I don't blame the fact that I'm getting older, that I've left the burners on low without pans on them, and it's been alarming me. We can all be forgetful at times. In the kitchen, though, that can be deadly. So try a memory aid, something that will help you keep track of burners that might still be burning or an oven that might still be on. Try tucking a spoon into a pocket to remind you that things are still simmering away, or set the timer, even if it's just to prompt you to return to the kitchen for that last safety check. Karen has built her memory aid into her nightly routine. When I'm finished cleaning my kitchen, before I turn out the lights, I always check the stove to see if the dumb burners are left on. <laughs> and what do you know? I have left the burner on low. And I've been doing this lately. It's not a safe thing to do, so I really need to look at it. In the daylight, it's hard to see that there's a very low flame there. It's not terribly hot. And while I'm thinking of things left on, um, I remember to check in the evening, make sure I haven't left the oven on. So remember, staying safe in the kitchen is about gathering the right safety tools and following some basic safety practices. Have a fully charged fire extinguisher in or near your kitchen. Have baking soda, pot lids, and cookie sheets at the ready. Never try to put out a grease fire with water. Don't cook when you're tired or on medication that can cause drowsiness. And use memory aids to make sure you're not leaving burners or ovens on. Firefighters here at Fire Station 89 in Los Angeles, just like firefighters in any city around the globe, rely on tools to save lives and protect themselves. Firefighters would never leave the station without tools like this axe and safety gear like this helmet, and they keep them at the ready 24-7. And that's a simple preparedness lesson we can learn from first responders. Gather the right safety equipment and the items you might need in the event of an emergency, maintain them in good working order, and keep them close at hand. Marilyn, Marvin, and Karen are just three of the nearly four million people who call Los Angeles home. L.A. might be known for beaches, Hollywood, and year-round sunshine, 
But like many places on the map, Los Angeles is at risk for disasters. Whether they're from Mother Nature, like wildfires or earthquakes, or from people, like house fires. Having emergency supplies ready when you need them is a basic part of being prepared here in Los Angeles. For our three older adults, that all starts with a bag. These go bags are wonderful because they keep everything, as it says, in case you have to go in a hurry, out the door. One staircase on the right, if the first one's not available. You can charge yourself. All right, that's a good idea. Okay, here we go. Okay, come on. This is my go bag. My husband and I each have one near the bed. I'll show you what's in the top of it. My favorite uh, vest which is very warm and comfortable. Then we have um, my shoes, and these are sandals because sandals with a nice sturdy bottom uh, often come in handy. One of the most important things is our pills. Now, this is a huge pill box uh, because we have a lot of vitamin pills and we thought it's important to have them. We have also this wonderful uh, little book. It's small, it's very compact, and it has a lot of information that I could just get to in almost a minute. What you pack in your go bag is as individual as you are, but there are some basic items we should all include. Sturdy shoes and a warm jacket. Flashlight with extra batteries a first aid kit, a whistle to signal for help if you're trapped, a dust mask, cell phone charger, emergency cash and small bills, widespread power outages will mean ATMs might not be working, a seven day supply of medications, an extra pair of glasses, a battery powered or hand crank radio. A full list of items is available at ready.gov slash kit Keep in mind the objective of your kit is self-sufficiency for at least 72 hours. So consider adding water, non-perishable food, and matches in a waterproof container. Where you keep your go bag is nearly as important as what's in it. Make sure it's easily accessible. And check it each month to assure batteries are still working, food is still edible, and water is still good to drink. I think it's helpful. Uh, I'm so glad we have the opportunity to have it. It makes you feel much more secure. Firefighters train every shift so that when that bell rings, they know just what to do. Get suited up, on the fire engine, and out the door. Training for emergencies isn't just for professional first responders. You can train too. Whether you live in a two-story condo like Karen, or the 11th floor of an urban high-rise like Marilyn and Marvin, it's important to create an evacuation plan in the event of an emergency. Come on, careful. Getting out of your house seems so obvious, so simple. We do it every day. But during an emergency, things can get surprisingly complicated. 
One of my most troubling memories as a firefighter was pulling up to a burning home and to see the family run around the house. In any other scenario, it may have even been funny. Almost a Keystone Cops or Three Stooges, the family was running around the house completely encircling the blaze, missing each other by seconds as we stepped off the fire engine, we had to yell stop. Sadly, the father who had run around the back ran into the house and nearly died. People have to have a plan, they have to follow it. If we hadn't gotten there when we did this man, we would have died in the fire for no reason but not having a plan on how to get out. It's easy to say, that would never happen to me. But in Los Angeles, the fire department responds to more than 8,000 structure fires each year. In 2013, firefighters responded to this high-rise fire in West LA. More than 100 people were evacuated, and five residents were hurt trying to get out. A man and his granddaughter nearly died in a smoke-filled stairwell before firefighters found them and rushed both to hospitals. This is why Karen, Marvin, and Marilyn have created family escape plans. My family escape plan starts with the fact that I have two doors, front and back and I try to keep them clear of furniture, which is a little hard in this small place. The first step in creating a family escape plan is identifying two ways out of your home. For Karen, that's the front and back doors. For Marvin and Marilyn, that's two ways out of their high-rise building. We sat down and made a family uh, escape plan. You know, remember, we got the two stairways you know, on either side of the buildings, that we could go down one if the other one, unfortunately, is, is inaccessible. And of course, the elevator would just get, no, no not even go near there. Yes, so if we plan on fire. doing that, I think that would be helpful. Like elevator, the elevator. Forget the elevator. An elevator should never be part of your escape plan. But identifying two ways out of your bedroom should be. If it's on the second floor, like Karen's, a folding fire ladder is a great investment. Make sure everyone in your home knows how to use it. Of course, a folding fire ladder won't help Marilyn and Marvin escape their bedroom. 11 stories is a long way down. This is the first high-rise apartment that we've ever lived in. It's just totally different. And uh, I think you have to learn what works in a high-rise, which you may not learn Yeah, but at least don't have to cut the grass or fix the house. That's true. Very true. So part of Marilyn and Marvin's family escape plan is knowing when not to escape. In other words, knowing when to shelter in place. This proves to you the importance of keeping your door closed in the event of a fire and sheltering in place. You can see the amount of damage to the outside of this door. But as you open this door and you look inside, you can see here in the door jams, on the walls, and on the ceiling, that there was very little to, if any, damage to this unit whatsoever. We do have some little signs of smoke, but there's absolutely no fire, no heat damage inside that unit. Individuals who were in this unit could have sheltered in place. The firefighters would have knocked down this fire, been able to rescue these individuals, and everything would have been fine for anybody on the other side of this door. Sheltering in place means residents aren't all evacuating at once, filling up the stairways. This means stairways are free of traffic, so firefighters can bring equipment and hoses up and victims of the fire down. Straight through. Right. Sheltering in place is something Marilyn and Marvin think about and prepare for. We need to have the plan to shelter here and I think one of the things would be to make sure and you're the good one for this that if we feel the smoke coming in a uh, put a towel across the front door I'll twist the towel because you can't do that and, okay. we'll, and we'll stick it down there 
and then we'll come back and see if we can wave to somebody. Yeah, well, we can get a scarf or something in a bright color and wave it out the window because then they'll see us and they'll know we're here and then either we need help or we're safe. If Marvin and Marilyn aren't sheltering in place and can evacuate safely, they've chosen a safe meeting place as part of their family escape plan. Once we come out of this building, we go to what is called a cafe. It's an outdoor area. A safe meeting place. As a safe meeting place. Mm -hmm. Your safe meeting place should be nearby and stationary. It's the place where everyone will meet once they've escaped the home in an emergency. Get out and stay out. Your neighborhood firefighters are trained to rescue people in the home. They're trained to protect your valuables. Trained and equipped, let us do our job. Get out, stay out, and direct us. A few simple words to the arriving firefighters, and we'll handle that matter quickly. We can't help you if you go back into the house. Not even for your pets. Evacuating with your pets is ideal, but if you can't get them out, tell firefighters where they might be. LA firefighters rescue pets on a regular basis. Gotta save. The only thing better than a well thought out family escape plan is a well practiced family escape plan, which is why Karen, Marilyn, and Marvin practice theirs once a month. Okay, here we go. Okay, come on. As Marilyn, Marvin, and Karen have proven, it's easy to live a safer life. Just a few simple steps and some pre-planning will go a long way toward helping you be more secure in your home and more prepared in the event of fires or other disasters. On behalf of My Safe LA and the Los Angeles Fire Department, thanks for watching and stay safe.